Well, welcome everybody. I'm Sabine from the University Hills Sustainability Committee. I'm uh, talking to you, speaking to you from the University Hills Community Center, which is located on the homelands of the uh, Ahashimin and uh, Tongva peoples. These peoples have been the stewards of this land uh, for the past 8,000 years. We, uh, as we are guests on this land, are dedicated to support the original stewards and their stewardship. Stewardship, it is protecting uh, nature. Stewardship is using resources wisely. And um, it is also to um, use our natural resources and um, um, wisely and the natural um, environment uh, responsibly. However, often the environment is degraded, it is destroyed, it is um, damaged. The good news is uh, ecosystems can be restored to the benefit of nature itself and uh, to the human life that it supports. And this is where our speaker comes in uh, today. I have the great pleasure of introducing um, John D. Liu. John is a filmmaker and uh, ecologist who has documented and studied ecosystem restoration across um, our world. John is the ecosystem ambassador of the Common Land as Foundation, which is an organization that helps with uh, large-scale uh, re restoration, ecosystem restoration initiatives worldwide. John is also the founder of the um, rest <laughs> Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement, and I'm sure you're going to talk about that a little bit later. Before we get to this exciting main part of the evening, I have a few housekeeping items. Yeah. Hold on, there we go. Well, um, this uh, event is in hybrid format. So uh, we are trying to make it good for the people um, here in the room and we are also making uh, it hopefully good for the uh, people uh, at home. We uh, apologize in advance for any technical uh, glitches. Um, the event will be recorded and the recording will be shared. So people at home, please put your email addresses in the chat if you want to receive a, a direct link to the recording. We've muted, muted all at home participants, but uh, you guys can still participate at the discussion uh, later. We will unmute you or you will unmute yourself. <laughs> Please uh, raise your hand uh, uh, using the raise hand tool, which can be found in your Zoom menu under reactions, or you can also put questions in the chat. Now for the people in the room, if you are participating in the discussion or have questions, we'll have a little microphone that will help the people at home to hear you uh, better. And we ask you if, if you speak to the microphone, into the microphone to keep your masks on. Um, the participants in the room, please put your names on the blue sheet um, that is uh, put on your uh, desk um, so uh, we know who was seated where. Um, and uh, please leave everything when you're leaving the venue. Last, this is a zero waste event, so the people who are here, please return all the dishes. Don't. Um, um, uh, throw any food out. We have a food waste basket over there as well. Um, and yeah, you can also please leave your name tags. All right, um, uh, next slide, please. This is for later. Uh, we've put together John's um, list of papers, presentation, and films, his address where you can reach him, information about the ecosystem restoration camps, and also how you can reach the University Hill Sustainability Committee. Well, um, uh, last, I still uh, want to thank actually the uh, University Hills Homeowner Representative Board for their support and the Urban Housing Campus uh, Authority. 
And I also want to extend special thanks to Quinn Levine, who has been volunteering his time and talent for the tech support. So, yeah. And without further ado, I'm now leaving the spot to John, who, uh, who you are anxiously waiting for. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> okay, I guess I have to overcome my basic shyness in order to address you. And if you believe that, then I'll sell you some real estate soon. Change the view real quick. Okay. And um, are there chat things? I shouldn't put it right in front of my face. Oh, <laughs> you, can, you can close that. You I can close it? Open. Okay. Well, good. So here I am. And now I'm going to uh, share my screen, I think, right? Yeah. So I have, uh, oh, it all looks the same to me. Oh, dear. There we go. Is that it? Oh, no, it's this one. Yes. Where is it? Quick time. There it is. All right. So hopefully that will work. I'm, I'm going to believe in it. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm grateful for the sustainability people and for the university and for all the support I've had because basically I've been homeless. I also have to thank the Common Land Foundation who supports my work. And um, I'm going to take you on a rather long personal journey. I hope that's okay. Um, so you. You, you don't know who I am, but there's my father, who uh, was Chinese. He passed away two years ago. My mother is American of Scottish descent. She is still with us at 102, still swimming <laughs> and playing, uh, doing Tai Chi and so on. She's quite extraordinary. Um, I went to China about 40 years ago, and I got married. This is my wife, Cosima. And together we had four children. They're very naughty, but uh, just the right amount of naughtiness. And they're no longer that size because that was back in the early 80s. We built a house and um, we have lived in this house for a very long time. And we all got older and older. And of course, my father passed away two and a half years ago at 99. So um, when I first went to China, it was uh, in 1979. I was 26 years old, and I had the opportunity to help to establish the CBS News Bureau in Beijing at the time of normalization of relations between China and the United States. And I worked in China uh, for CBS and then Radio Televisione Italiana and Zoytis so Deutsches Fernsehen for a long time. It was 10 years with CBS and then about six years with the others. And in that time, China transformed itself <laughs> from this sleepy communist backwater to a superpower. So this was fairly interesting to observe close hand the idea of transformational change. I covered amazing stories like the rise of China, from poverty and isolation, the collapse of the Soviet Union, Tiananmen, also terrorism in different parts of the world. But in, in 1995, Actually, in 1994, were the first time the World Bank asked me to go out and take a look at the Luce Plateau. So the Luce Plateau was the cradle, or is the cradle, of Chinese civilization. It's in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And the whole plateau is about 640,000 square kilometers, or approximately the size of France. And Luce is a windborne sediment that's 
created by the movement of glaciers high in the Himalayas and deposited by wind. And so because of where this is, if you dig around in there, you might find some interesting things. This was the birthplace of the Han race, so it's the largest ethnic group on the planet. So it must have been extremely nourishing at one time. This is to the southwest in Sichuan, but this is what it looked like when I first went to the Lewis Plateau. So I'm going to ask a friend of mine who's the head of climate mitigation now at the World Bank internationally to share his thoughts on this. But I'm actually, am I hearing this? I hope so. Talk to me, Jurgen Fogela from the World Bank. Now when we came to this place in the world stuff for the first time, we were all really shocked. You know, we thought all the time. Well, how can how can ever anybody try to live in an area that was so huge, and so fundamentally destroyed for nothing? And the truth is we spent two years working with the local people, with the farmers, with the local officials, with the, so with the experts in the various fields of biology, soil water conservation, forestry, agricultural environment, try to understand what it would take to do something like this. And after three years, we still didn't have any answers. The World Bank didn't have the answer, and the local people didn't have the answer. And we spent another year and a half talking to the farmers in the villages, trying to understand what they had done in the past 20 or 30 years that was successful. And it was really interesting, not much was there to show. Because the current practices at that time were just not sustainable at all. So, so, I mean, it was fairly stunning to go and see this, this huge place which was fundamentally ecologically destroyed, but also to know that this had given birth to the largest ethnic group on the planet. And so anthropologically and historically it was interesting, but from an ecological perspective, I started to see how the ecological functions were, well, in this case, massively degraded and saw the consequences of what this did. But I also began to see the methods that were being employed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and by the World Bank and, and the local communities, what they were doing in order to take care of this. And at the same time, I was seeing that this is the cause the degradation is the cause of massive flooding and of drought and, well, wildfires and increased intensity and, and frequency of extreme weather events. So I began to get obsessive about what I was seeing because it, in seeing all this, I began to compare it with what I was seeing in, in, I had been seeing for the first 15 years of my career as a journalist. So when I compared ec ecology to the geopolitical and economic events that I'd been seeing, I thought, actually, ecology is more important because no one's going to remember the egos of the kind of megalomaniac leaders who think that they're in control of everything, but actually they come and they go and they die and you know they're kind of crazy and some are good and some are not so good. And anyway, if the story stopped here, it would be a pretty sad story that we have. But then the, something bizarre began to take place. This is what they always do when I show up on the, on the plateau. They, they come out, I don't, I don't know why they do that. Um, it, it really takes a lot of energy, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. But anyway, the, <laughs> this, is, this is what they do when they see a television camera, actually. So, but 
what happened then was they decided to aggregate all these people because the the activities that they were engaged in were not at all sustainable so they couldn't continue to do any of them so they banned them all they made all the activities that they were doing illegal they said you can't uh, free range goats and sheep you can't cut any trees you can't plant on the sides of hillsides and basically that's all that they were doing so in order to make it possible for them to survive they had to replace their their livelihoods they had to train them in other behaviors and so they took this enormous area the pilot project was 35,000 square kilometers approximately the size of Belgium and they just said okay we're going to transform this area and they started to do this and and as Jurgen mentioned he everybody thought well that's pretty ambitious maybe this is a poverty reduction thing or you know nobody really actually massively believed in the outcome because you believe what you see and you see all these degraded landscapes and you think well okay we can try and if we try maybe it'll be better than it is now but you don't really expect it to be transformational and uh, now there's a, a a guy from the um, Ministry of Water Resources who was in overall charge of restoring this particular area and he's going to tell us what, what their thinking was in just a moment and you can see that they didn't really have very serious technology this was done by hand in, in large part gradually they moved to these these computers or, or these these uh, these bulldozers but they also had computers and satellite imagery, which was very helpful in what they were doing. But I think, I hope my... The goal was to give a hat to the metals, give a belt to the hills, as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the downs which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve. When I first fell Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. So this is in nine years. Or this nine years? 2009. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces no, it's has resulted 14. in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. Sorry, this is 14 or 15 years. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. So, what was interesting about this is that it was done by the local people, it ended the negative behaviors, it returned ecological function over a broad area, which reduce, well, sequesters a huge amount of carbon, re-regulates the hydrological cycle, re-regulates -re the weather patterns, reduces the risk of extreme and, and uh, weather events so this was really quite stunning to see this and I had now become totally fascinated first in dysfunction in ecosystems and then I became fascinated with functional ecosystems and I thought you know it's kind of depressing to see all these areas which are desertified what does it look like when you go to 
fully functional ecosystems, how do they compare? What could I learn there? And I got very fortunate. I kept getting fellowships to go study. So I, I never finish because I, I dropped out of school to be a television cameraman and I'm still studying. So it's a it's very interesting phenomenon. But I also realized that what I was learning was not something that was really about individual scholarship because it's irrelevant if it's just known, if, it's, if you consider it theoretically. But let's do that for a moment. So if we look back at this, so let's say 10 to 12,000 years ago, human beings in the Lus Plateau and also in the Fertile Crescent began to do agriculture. And so essentially they, they emerged in a pristine system. So the evolutionary system, the evolutionary succession had led to a fully functional atmosphere, a fresh water system, fertile soils and amazing biodiversity. But when human beings began to interact, I think the first, first was hunting probably and taking out megafauna and secondarily was settled agriculture, which was uh, beginning of the really huge impacts. But it basically led to ecosystem collapse and everything that I saw as I studied this definitely suggested that if you consistently degrade landscapes, it leads to a, a paradigm shift where you've cr crashed the system and then your civilization also fails. But it's interesting, when the Chinese intervened in the Lus Plateau, they changed the evolutionary trajectory to bring back something which is more aligned with evolutionary succession because you can have always more biodiversity, always more biomass, and always more accumulated organic matter, which seems to be the basis of the, of the natural systems without human impact. But I've had a lot of other thoughts about human impact since, since then because, I mean, we're close to 8 billion people. So you can't really say, well, people should just disappear. Um, we have to figure out what is the relationship between human beings and the natural systems. And I found that really ecological function or dysfunction is reflecting the state of human consciousness. And I wondered what actually is possible. Like, is it just a problem that we're 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 ignorant of this? And when when I started thinking this way, I started to like like what are, what are the scientific implications that I'm seeing here? And I was lucky because I had quite a lot of advisors, and I had fellowships to many interesting research places and I was able to broadcast my findings on the BBC and National Geographic and so on. But I found that it's, it's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes. Well, that's pretty stunning. I mean, I think you might want to think about that for California <laughs> right now. And I also saw some other striking things like in degraded lands, you have massive temperature increases in comparison to natural systems or even restored systems. And this is, this is really important because the, we're looking at temperatures, but we're being told, you know, you, we're, we have to stay with a, in a 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade. I mean, what does that mean? I, I don't know what that means. One to, one to two degrees centigrade. And what's astonishing is that I see temperature differentials in degraded states that are vastly higher than two to four degrees centigrade. They're in the, easily in the range of 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. And in the extreme, I found a, a terrible outlier, which I'll show you in a moment, which is 45 degrees centigrade difference. Just by human activity, human consciousness can change surface temperatures. So what is possible? So that 
kind of became the question for me, like, wh what could you do with this information? What does it mean? Now, this is the Taklamakan Desert in Xinjiang. You have heard about Xinjiang because of the Uyghurs and so on. You probably will hear more about it because it's very close to Afghanistan. It's, it's, there's a lot of separatism and extremism and terrorism there. So the Chinese are terrified of that destroying their peaceful <laughs> society as, I mean, I think everybody is really. Anyway, this is the Taklamakan. In July at noon, on the surface of, of the sands here, the temperature will be 70 degrees centigrade. And this is the second largest shifting sands desert in the world. And so what do the Chinese do here? They build a shelter belt through the middle of the Taklamakan Desert for 426 kilometers. And they do it with human ingenuity. They, they find a very large saline aquifer below the desert and they make pumping stations every four kilometers. They use this Israeli drip irrigation system going two kilometers in either direction from every pumping station. They create the largest, uh, well, the, well the, really the, the most extreme botanical garden you've ever seen in, in a massive depression like very low, way below sea level in the middle of the desert. And they find out which plants that will survive in saline water in these outrageous conditions, and they grow them on both sides of the road to protect this road. And the, the reason that they, they built the road was to um, bring oil out of the desert because they found oil deposits in the desert. But on the other hand, the other thing that happened was that they connected very remote tr tribal people f that were like out there to the rest of the world. So I, I don't know how that, you know, I think there are some cultures that would rather stay away from, but there are other cultures that might want to want to to know more. So I began to go all over the world and look at ecosystems. And I began to see that the functional ecosystems were where the inspiration, where the beauty, where knowledge could be had, whereas we could study dysfunction forever. And all we'd really know about is what's wrong and that it's much better to think about what's right and to do what needs to be done to make natural systems return functional systems to return this by the way is the andrews uh, uh, experimental forest on the mckinsey river in oregon and it's a primary forest that's never been cut so you can learn quite a lot about what soil types and what biodiversity, what symbiotic relationships exist and so, so on. Now we're going to more tropical areas. I've been to more than 90 countries. I got very fortunate IUCN, a number of other foundations and, and research institutes, Rothamsted International and others. Reading University, et cetera. But anyway, these systems are so much different than the degraded states that you also have to kind of consider what we're human beings thinking about. And this brings me into this weird philosophical realm where I'm considering like the Garden of Eden and the, the idea that human beings are emerge in paradise and then somehow human beings sin and they're cast out of the garden 
And I've never quite understood the whole snake and the apple thing. But if you look at it from this perspective that natural systems are, have always increasing biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, then you get to the point where, oh, we may know what original sin is. Maybe original sin is the reduction of biodiversity, which leads to the reduction in the, accumula in the growth of the biomass and in the reduction in the accumulation of organic matter, which are the processes or the principles which then stimulate the processes that created constantly filter and continuously renew the atmosphere, the hydrological cycle, the, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity. By the way, that's Russia. This is, Mo this is uh, Malaysia. So there's wonderful systems remaining um, if they haven't been destroyed. This is in, in uh, British Guyana, proto-Amazonia. And so I kept thinking about all these things. This is in South Africa. I mean, human beings have been around a very long time. And it's interesting to think that many cultures actually considered that natural systems, biological systems, other systems were sacred. And that that was a protecting fact. I mean, they worshiped the, these systems, they would never destroy them. That was pretty important, but reducing natural systems to um, materialism, to extraction and buying and selling, that might not be such a good idea. This is uh, just dune stabilization. If you just push straw into the sand, then whatever moisture will accumulate and go down the straws, and then bacteria will come and start to deteriorate the straws. And without planting anything, birds will come up and poop on there and seeds will come up. Without planting anything, you can actually regenerate deserts. Now, if you, did, if you followed this with grids and you continuously went closer and closer, you'd completely cover this. Now, What is the value of this knowledge? What is the value of doing that at a time when we're facing existential threats from climate change? This is the best organic soil in the world coming from the biodynamic farms in, in, in uh, Sweden and Yarna. This is Rene Haller. He is basically Yoda. And he takes completely ruined landscapes like this. The most important thing is to, as fast as possible, get vegetation, uh, vegetation to grow. And uh, that can be again uh, done in, in very adverse areas. So that's what he's able to do. And uh, what happens now, there's hardly a place in this forest out there which has no vegetation. There's grass, there's trees, everything. Before, you know, it was uh, two and a half square kilometers of desert. So all over the world, there are people who are getting this and they're not waiting about, <laughs> they're just doing it because it doesn't seem to be in the mainstream, but they know it's necessary for their own lives and they know it's necessary for the planet. But if this were to shift and this became the central intention of human civilization, then there would be no possibility that we could fail because it's, it's, it's only when we do this kind of forensics and we look at, well, why are we degrading the landscapes? And then we say, well, we want more. We want to extract more. We want to buy and sell things. We want to control more as individuals. We don't want to share with the other people. They can die. You know, that needs to change somehow. Everybody is equal. Everybody, if they're born, is a 
is a representation of all life since the beginning of time. It can't be any other way. So they have to, we, ha we, we all have to realize that there's no us in them, there's just us. And it's interesting that all of these things are possible. And I have spent quite a long time trying to get people and encourage people to do this and I've been working especially in large scale with the United Nations and the World Bank and governments and so on. This is where you can find my, my stuff and I, I'm, I know that uh, Sabine is going to send it out. This is what I'm working on now. The movement that we're building here together is about bringing back hope, it's about bringing back a purpose in life. The biggest problem this is not climate change. So as a result, we're facing so many problems, but the solution to them is the same. We start restoring the ecology, the ecosystems. If we apply regenerative techniques to bring it back to life, this is enough to reverse climate change. The purpose of ecosystem restoration camps is to restore land that has been degraded by humans. What we need to do is go to the historically degraded landscape, which were once the Garden of Eden. Volunteers can come from around the world, or they can be local community members, volunteering five hours a day, helping to restore the planet. We are in this restoration camp. You're not waiting for somebody else to do the work. You join the group that is actually restoring this planet. I quit my studies to come here to do a little bit of service, to give myself to the planet. This is the thing that I want to do. This is the try that I want to join. Can be a solution bigger than the things that I can do. This is what I want to be. This is what I want to be doing. We need to stand up together. We're, we're a new international of green minded people. It's, it's a vital concept. That's why it's a fault. It starts with one cat. Most people go to that cat. They bring the idea home, then they start new camps. Go from a very degraded ecosystem back to a fully functional ecosystem. Everybody opened their eyes and they're like, oh, it's that simple. Desert used to be productive lands and could be made productive again. It is possible to change a landscape from a desert and to completely repaint it so that there's food, water, and, and wildlife in abundance. I think the camp also can teach us that we can live with very simple, eat the food we grow, and sleep under the stars, and still have our comfort. Camps is, is a simple way. People get closer to the, to the earth and to the ecosystem itself, and it's, uh, it's easy to implement and it doesn't need traces. It's a great place to experiment for scientists, a great place to learn uh, how to grow food, how to become more self sufficient. Soil is the basis of life. If you have a soil that has no life, nothing good can grow from there. So by restoring the ecosystem, which involves restoring the soil, adding more organic matter to the soil and more life, uh, that soil will hold the water much longer, will hold much more nutrients, and that way bring back fertility. As we stop placing trees, we stop taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we can stop that process of the climate change. This area in Spain, for example, is, a, is one of, of the most vulnerable areas. Degradation of the, of the ecosystem mirrors in the degradation of society. It's not just about restoring the land, it's also about restoring, restoring the society, restoring people. With new people coming in and new knowledge coming in, connecting with local. So the, the bakery at the local village has a better business too. Or we have the example of how to do things that they can come from the Being an uh, inspiration uh, for the region, for the farmers who are here struggling, but also for young people maybe to come back to the land and like see that farming that can be cool. Let's, let's kind of bring back the spirit of childhood, of being like projects and doing things together. And I think that the, the camp will bring back the possibility of playing like a kid but with a purpose. So the more that ordinary people like you and me are able to stand up and, and support it, the more momentum that's going to get. Many initiatives all around the world are popping up. Everybody wants to make a camp now. That's fantastic and that's what we wanted. We wanted to inspire the people to 
big initiative. You can come to camp. I think that would be a really great option for someone who is available and wants to do something meaningful. They're going to be offering film culture design courses here. But if you can't come, you can become a member of the system restoration camps by donating 10 euro per month. That's just a really simple way to basically make these camps a reality. We want to restore the earth. We want to live in the beautiful paradise that the earth is. Come to ecosystem restoration camps and make a part of the future. So I'm not an advisor to people who just say, yeah, we can do it. We can reverse this biggest problem at your position. We want back to the ground, uh, getting dirty, getting back to the soil, with love, with joy, with companionismo and camaraderia. Uh, it's definitely really interesting. Thing. Well, I do hope you'll join. <laughs> um, I should tell you that uh, the first year there was one camp. The second year there were two camps. The third year there were 21 camps. The fourth year there were 37 camps. And by the end of this year, there will be more than 50 camps around the world. And I don't think it has to stop. We can go to thousands and millions of camps because these are all self-organizing, self-governing and autonomous camps that are linked together by a network. So what's, what's interesting about this is that we don't need to wait. We can go immediately to do what we know needs to be done instead of having endless conversations about <laughs> what are we going to do? I mean, I think we can get better. We can measure and, and have scientific uh, results and, and see what they are, but we, we know enough to know that in evolutionary succession, you always have more biodiversity, more biomass, more accumulated organic matter. And if you're going in this direction, that's not going to work. You've got to go in this direction. So let's go and restore that. Now the other part of this becomes, what is the value of that? Because if we try to do this, it, and we do do this, it's like, well, they're volunteers, they're, it's charity. But if you look at this, we're facing existential threats. This is more valuable than going shopping. This is more valuable than all the different things that are happening. So the society needs to have a profound and nuanced conversation about what is the central intention of humanity. And so let's start that now. Were you seeing it full screen? Yeah, I have it. Oh, wait, there's a microphone. No, no, I, it's a very, it's not really a question. I, I wanted to go back to your contact page if that's possible. Sure. Do you want to do that? Yeah, okay. Do you want to do that? Okay. Thank you so much. But there's a microphone and we're supposed to have a nuanced conversation so somebody back there or you're just waving or you're uh, come on I'm, I'm, I'm there's somebody in the back Well, 
Well, I, I think I'm kind of limited personally, but I think you can, and I think ev everybody can, basically. I, I, I find myself to be relatively mediocre, and, um, but I am persistent. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you, if you try and you keep going for, say, three decades, <laughs> it probably will have some kind of result. Now the result is it, you know, it's certainly not enough. Even, you know, it's lovely that we have 50 camps in, in, in uh, five years, but it's not enough. But they're growing rapidly. We now have about 20 villages in Syria, which are studying agroecology. We have about 17 villages in a, in a, a watershed in, um, in Jordan, it's very beautiful. And that's very impactful. We're, we have two projects in, in Egypt, and we're actually on the, through another, not really, we're, we're going to employ the camps in this, but it's not only about the camps because it includes the, the Egyptian government and international agencies and even industrial groups. Can I can I share my screen again? If yeah. if I do that, sure. um, okay. Uh, well, I think I will wait to share my screen until I my I'm ready for it. So, okay. is that that's going to do something? But sorry, everybody, if it's not. Uh, here we go. Uh, I don't want Zoomtopia, whatever that is. I want uh, So this is my academia page, so if you do get a chance to go there and then, oh, I need to oh, I need to, to go back to Zoom, share, go back. To the academia page. Yeah, that's, no, that's that one. And then share it. Now that should be shared. And then I need to go to full, full. Where is that one? Um, go back can, to the Zoom. Well, you can use the green marker at the top. To be large? Yeah. To, yeah. to be full? Oh, okay. Okay. So that's working now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so in here, you'll find all sorts of things. Like I highly recommend this, this uh, Sekim. This is a biodynamic community in Egypt, which has had 40 some years of development. It's really excellent. And, but anyway, you have all kinds of films from all over the world because I've been very busy plugging away where nobody noticed, but um, go and look at some of them. Don't binge, but. You know, but uh, I think then there's a lot of films, and then there's papers, and um, what's happening? There's this one is rather interesting. It's called the Holy Grail of Restoration, and this is this this picture is what you see from satellite images of the Sinai Peninsula. It looks like the heart of the region, and all of the hydrological function looks like the arteries and veins of a, of a heart or a body, and they're etched in stone. So this is not a this is not theoretical. This is this is the result of enormous flows of water and energy over geologic and evolutionary time. So. We know what happens, and, and in these places, we also know that every periodically they uh, they have um, flash floods. So it's like not like there's no water. It just means that the water is not infiltrated and it's not retained. So we can fix this. We can have a, a, a number of other <laughs> other things that we're going to do. I I I'm, I don't want to talk about it now, but feel free to read that and you can always reach me.
if you need to. John, we have a question from uh, the online audience. Do they want to ask it themselves? Yes. 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 Can we hear them? Yes. They unmute. Yes. Unmute. I can unmute. Is it known? Mm -hmm. uh, I will send you the ask. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There you go. You can talk. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> thank you thank you so much for this this was uh wonderful i learned about your work when my dad shared it with me some months ago and i it's just very inspiring um and heartening for a young person who's a little bit uh disturbed about the future i one thing that i've been wondering um, reading about your projects and um, some other ecosystem restoration projects, especially I think the one that really made me think was the um, project in the Sinai. My battery's dying. Uh oh. <laughs> um, First. I, I think that one that you were just showing us involved um, a Dutch company helping to. Um, create the the restoration should i wait till you get your uh, in my in my car there is a power supply in the white bag in the second in the back seat <laughs> it says low battery if i disappear what's going to happen uh we, we can pick up on a different computer okay well go 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 back okay. i the question i wanted to ask i just wanted to hear some of what you think about the balance of urgency given the emergency we're in with um, the possibility of reenacting issues of colonialism that got us here in the first place. So how we balance urgency with deliberative democracy and sovereignty. And I just would like to hear more. Well, I, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that's a terrific question. Um, I think that uh, what I see happening is that people are choosing to go camping <laughs> by themselves, and that's pretty sovereign of them. And uh, that's an interesting thing. So if we if we're able to, oh my goodness, okay. Uh, okay, we're good. Oh, we sur we survived that. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> Hello there. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see if we can see some more people. Um, so uh, I think that the camps allow us to be sovereign. They allow us to make decisions now. And as that spreads out, then you you see that we have almost gridlock in the in the vertical hierarchies of the of the whatever this you know I, I don't know I don't know how to describe it exactly Rome at the in the at the end or something like that but um, then you know if if that's if if we're just going to discuss well, that's not very satisfying. And what I notice in the camps is that everybody who's going to camp and they're doing it, they're having a really good time. And so you can actually sort of tune out the news kind of uh, cycle that's just devastating. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how to watch it anymore. And the, um, you know, it seems to be keeping us into a cerebral or a, a theoretical space and that if we actually go and work in the camps, it works and we can take care of everybody. Now, if we start doing this in urban areas, I've been thinking about central kitchens and creator spaces and having everybody, you know, everybody eats and everybody participates and you know so the real key to this i think it's and for young people i think it is very important because the future is not going to be like the past the future is going to be different 
because the past is like in China where they were destroying the, the, their land. It couldn't keep going. The end of it is, is collapse of the ecosystems. You collapse the, collapse the ecosystems, you collapse the civilization. So you have to restore the fundamental basis of the civilization. And it's not philosophical thought, it's not prejudice, it's not, you know, it's, it's that you have water and air and that you take care of everybody. And I think looking, we also need to have peace. We have to realize that without peace, you're not going to be able to restore ecosystems. You'll, you won't be able to act, you'll only be able to react. So I think just taking the sovereignty and saying, okay, let's do restoration. Let's take care of everybody, let's feed everybody. But maybe think about like, let's have 150 people in a camp and then say, well, if there's more than that, let's have another camp, you know, because if we get too many people, then you're definitely gonna get these vertical hierarchies and in fact, you'll have to because nobody will know anybody. So how would you deal with that? So I think this is a, this is a way forward for us. I hope that helps you. And I don't know how to deal with those big, when the government say, we want to work with you, I go, okay. But if they don't, I don't really wanna like have too much to do with them. Just like, okay, we're gonna make more camps and we're gonna, and they're all over the place now. They're in Guatemala and they're in Peru and they're in Kenya and India and you know, all over the world. So you can, you can go camping and you can make camps. There are camps in California. There's a... a I think I can just talk No, 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 because they won't be able to hear you. They want to hear you. Oh, got it. Yeah. Well, uh, I would say they're all different. So excuse me, everybody out there in, in uh, are they seeing this or not? No. no, they're not seeing this. So I'm gonna just try to figure out how to do this. And then- uh, you, can, you can share that? Yeah. That's not what I wanna share. You can, are you gonna type in something in Chrome or no? Yes. Yeah, that, this is Chrome. Oh, okay. Well, this is Chrome too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna type in ecosystemrestorationcamps.org and then- I think you have to close it because it's- Then we close that. Yeah. And go back to Zoom. Go back to Zoom. Oh, thank you. And then do this and then do this. Okay, right. So, uh, and then I have to get big, that one. Yeah, okay, so um, so here's the website, and um, I think it. Uh, how can, can I move this? Yeah, I can move that. It's got to go there. Um, so you could go into there are all these different camps, so you can find camps in different parts of the world, Europe. Australia, North America, Central and South America, Asia, not too many in Asia, that's too bad. Africa, you know, so so basically, and there's, there's a new group, and then how to start a camp, you can click on this and it'll tell you, there's like, oh look, uh, build an ecosystem restoration camp in your community. Camp interest form, becoming a, you know, okay. So there, they've been, there have been five years of discussion, so they're starting to do that. There's somebody else, I think, with their hand up. So uh, thank you for a very inspiring presentation. It's fabulous. I'm curious about the 
curious to hear your thoughts and also the rest of the community who's here and online about what we can do here in the University of Hills to actually contribute to ecosystem restoration and address the challenge of our times. Well, that's a great idea. I think we need a Hobart. <laughs> no, no, Hobart is not. Well, you know, in here in Los Angeles, there's something called the Soil Sponge Initiative. And it's also connected to the Birdhouse, which is the first urban ecosystem restoration camp. So you can also go to the birdhouse and see that. So that's Chrome? Yeah. And if I do that, I'll actually be able to even change from this? No. Yeah. No. Be able to. Okay. How do I do that? I get nothing. Oh, there it is. Maybe take it off that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the birdhouse is at the birdhouse. So you can go to at the birdhouse. And when you get to at the birdhouse, it'll tell you what, what they're doing. And you can see their, their work. And they're doing urban gardens and they're doing um, transformation of soil, soil sponge. And they're doing something, they started actually with the Hollywood Orchard, which goes around and collects all the extra fruit <laughs> from fruit trees in the, in the movie industry people's homes. And they take it to the downtown women's shelter and to, to other, other places where there's people who need fresh food. So that's, that's a good thing. And I think that you have all the, everything that you need here with the university, with the, the people who are working on the restoration. I've, I've seen and walked through your restored areas. They're quite lovely. But one of the things that the camps are about is teaching people to do this and then not limiting, not limiting this to their, you know, inside their walls, but to, to making it, uh, it basically everywhere. So you, you, you can learn how to do this and then you can do it everywhere. Several. Oh, sorry. Well, I think that's a very good question. I think often people are considering rainfall as available moisture. And that's, that's something that I started to look into. And in my observations show that when you have the lower hydrological cycle, so you, solar radiation is interrupted at the height of the canopy. And then the physics of everything that's happening after that is altered and you have a microclimate below the canopy. And of course, here in California, you had 400 foot tall trees. So that was the highest expression of evolutionary succession that I've ever seen in the world. But to understand that 95 to 97% of that has been destroyed in the last 200 years is pretty tragic. So what you're seeing now in California is early stage desertification. And when you understand that, then you go, well, if we talk about Mauritania or Egypt or the Sinai or someplace, 
we're talking about late stage desertification, but we're even, think, you know, we're even, we're not just imagining, we know that it's possible to do restoration. Now, I wouldn't do what the Chinese are doing and go like straight through the middle of the worst desert or something. But if you build from the edges and you, and you get to a scale, I think the scale that we're, there's been some research in this area that sa says that if you get to 100 square kilometers, 10 by 10 kilometers, mm -hmm. that sort of scale, then you're going to alter enough that you're actually sort of attracting moisture. So you, and when you have, when, when there is moisture and there's no canopy, no vegetation, no soil, no organic soils, no organic material, what you're doing is you're elevating the evaporation rates and there's no respiration. So the evapotranspiration doesn't really work as a, as a measurement. If there's no vegetation, it only works if it's a functional system. So as a functional system, evapotranspiration is quite a good measure, but in a degraded system, you really want to know what are the ev evaporation rates. And what you find when you do this, the other, the other thing that's happening is that the density of the air is altered by the lack of, of moisture. And so when the winds come, they're very strong. So you have increased winds. You also have the directional, the, the wind direction is determined by temperature differentials. So, and then vortex activity is created by serious um, temperature differential. So like understanding that and realizing, well, it's up to us. We can lower the surface temperatures. We can change the surface temperatures. Well, all right. So now we know that we can alter the surface temperatures. What happens when we alter the surface temperatures? There are almost no places with zero rainfall. There are some, but very few. So, and even some of the places with zero rainfall still have vegetation. Extreme, <laughs> extremophytes grow there, you know, it's bizarre. So what happens if we restore the lower hydrological cycle in a 10 by 10 kilometer area? Then you, you are creating the conditions which allow for critical mass of condensation, well, cloud formation, condensation, and precipitation. And that seems to be a ratio between air and moisture and nucleation, which ideally comes from respiration from plants. So, you know, like once we, once we start to see what, it, what is a multi-dimensional symbiotic system and we I want to say Grok, because I read Ray, what was his name? Asimov. What? Isaac Asimov. Was it? What? Stranger in a Strange Land, Ray Bradbury, wasn't it? Yeah, Ray Bradbury. Anyway, um, so if we understand this, that, that we are not actually really individuals and we're not masters of the universe we're pieces of a of a, of a uh, meta organism we're, we're parts of a meta organism and we're also parts of a species but that species is only part of this other larger meta organism so when we see that and and understand what it means then we probably don't think like just getting more and more stuff for ourselves is the purpose of life. Maybe the purpose of life is something else, like having yet more generations of life to come. And so if that's our purpose, then we definitely want to restore the lower hydrological cycle. And we definitely want to lower surface temperatures. And we also probably look at that and go, well, guess what? that activity and that result is vastly more valuable than everything that human beings have ever made and everything that human beings will ever make. And, and this is such a, an amazing thought because it means that when you restore 
the earth, the economy grows larger. And when the economy grows larger and you treat everybody with fairness and kindness and sovereignty, then not only do you have more, but you can share it with everybody instead of like imagining the best idea would be like for everybody to get as much as they can for themselves and anybody who doesn't get anything, well, they can just die. You know, that doesn't seem like a very good idea. It doesn't work for, for society. So society, the arc, of, the arc of history is toward justice, toward democracy, toward e equality, isn't it? seems to be. So if, if, if humanity comes up against oppression or comes up against domination or genocide or slavery or any of these things, it wants to, it wants to stop that. <laughs> That's not a good idea. War is hell. So let's not go there. you. Well, I guess I would say mainly that um, to me, uh, ecological function is the key to this and that it's not one thing it's it's a it's a system so essentially the concept of multi-dimensional symbiotic systems are is is the core of this so you can't really say biodiversity without talking about hydrology you can't really talk about biodiversity and hydrology without talking about soil because they're all interrelated and then that takes you to microbiology, to, to, to geology, to chemistry, to physics, to atmospheric science. To, so they're all there. And probably since I was such a poor student, the idea that you had to study all these things, I never <laughs> would have tried if I knew that I had to study all these things. But, if you just launch on and you carry on, then it becomes rather, it, it, you know, it becomes clearer 
as you go go along, and it's infinitely fascinating. I think that's the other the other thing. And as you said, it, there is unbelievable satisfaction in seeing a stream or a spring come back. You know, I mean, it's like wow. So the fact that we can do these kinds of things, and then of course the tragedy is that we're not not doing that at scale. That we're not saying, hey, we got to do that. Let's do it. So, um, you know, people ask me like, because <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. So people say, wow, if you're right, why aren't we just all doing it? You know, I think, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, it's not up to me, really. It's up to you. So um, I, I think in this, in this question about what we are trying to, to accomplish, we really need to realize that there's so many preconceived ideas and we, we, we really just need to observe. Like, like if we have an opinion about this, then we could very easily be wrong. But if we don't have an opinion and we're just observing, like what's going on? So like in many places when I go and I look at, and people are going, well, oh my goodness, we've got this invasive weed that's growing here. Oh, it's so horrible. This invasive weed, let's kill it. We're gonna poison it. We're gonna whack it. We're gonna burn it. We're gonna do something. And I'm like, are you sure that that's the right thing to do? You know, like um, in, in my experience, in degraded states, probably there have been extinctions. And, and those extinctions uh, leave gaps in, in, the, in, in, the, in the system. And so probably there will be another plant or, that will come in and, and exploit the gap. And you could say, well, that's terrible. Oh my gosh, we have to get rid of it. We, want, we don't want that one. But if you do, you, you probably need to look a little bit further. The other, the other thing we haven't talked about yet is time. So the, the concepts of time, cosmic time, geologic time, evolutionary time, human history, human life, you know, the future, you know, we really need to think about time. So if you're looking at these massive infestations of say alien species that you're you know might be somebody might be worried about what's the result if you got a, a sort of higher succession canopy well that probably eliminate your problem entirely what exactly is happening with this with this uh with this invasive alien well it's probably changing the ph and increasing the soil <laughs> moisture and you know, it's leaving a lot of organic material as it dies and gives up its body to nurture the soils and you know okay and then it's 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 creating the space for the legacy genome to return so we've seen this in china very very successfully with planting out masses of monocultures but if you go back 15 20 years from then you don't see any monocultures at all. You barely see the thing that you planted. It's, it's, it's retreating because it's being, it has done its job and it's being replaced with the legacy genome, which is coming back and coming back very strong and, and rapidly. So I would say ob observation is better and not having prejudice against specific types of plants I mean, the one that I have trouble with is eucalyptus because, you know, but, you know, so I've been looking at, well, if you're going to replace eucalyptus, you're going to have a real, quite a task because it has an aliopath. And so that's not going to be the most easy thing to do. But okay, if you're going to do it, do it right. Grow 30 year old trees before and transplant them in there and restore the soils before, you know, when you, I mean, and get everything ready before you cut the eucalyptus out. 
and you're going to have to take the whole root thing out too and so it's going to be quite the deal but all right it's doable and then use every piece of that eucalyptus take the you know extract the extract the oils take the any timber that can be made from that create biochar with the rest of the leftovers and you know that i think you know so have a plan is a good idea So I'm just kind of following up on uh, the question before this. We were talking about water and we were talking about rainfall. I was kind of thinking as you were saying that about the aquifers and groundwater, especially in California, because that's such a big source of water for both farming and unfortunately in some places for adult sources. So. <laughs> uh, it's it just for, I mean, because of the decreased rainfall in some of these places, they're increasingly turning to groundwater, especially in the Central Valley, which is a farming place. places. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious, have any of your camps gone to places where, you know, uh, collapsing aquifers and decreased groundwater have been a problem? Have they ever dealt with that issue? You know, is there successful ways of dealing with that? Because I've heard a lot of stuff that's positive about restoring rainfall. I haven't heard much about restoring some of these degraded glass aquifers, groundwater that's been over the top of these kind of stuff. But that's an interesting thing to grow. Well, I think we're going to have to probably measure what happens. And so it's pretty hard to say it's not possible. It's pretty hard to say it's absolutely for certain that we can do it. But the fact is we're going to have to do something. <laughs> and so what are we going to do? And we're looking at very extreme types of technologies now. And some are, some are I really like. I don't know if you know who Dr. John Todd is, but uh, do you know Dr. John Todd? So he, he created what was called the living machine back in the 70s. He was at Woods Hole, New Alchemy Institute, the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And, and um, he's using domes to, and then tanks to do a type of, um, passive solar desalinization in a way and at the same time growing a lot of food in in those tanks so that you're getting fresh water you're getting food you're getting and and some of that is also um, working with diatoms and and so Essentially, I think often, you know, we would like to have a big, beautiful oak tree, <laughs> but things are different now. You know, we, we, we need to go back to the, be, to the beginning of it because we've lost some of the foundations. And I think it's really necessary that we understand that we're losing the life support systems on the planet. So you lose the life support systems on the planet, then you know, you're not going to be saying, well, I want this species or that species. You're not going to, you know, you're going to have a collapse scenario and the collapse scenarios look very bad when, when you, when you go there. But the, the interesting thing is that it may, in many cases may not be impossible. So you have to do an analysis. So I, I, I'm hopeful, uh, in like the Sinai, because that's where we get to where we get to experiment now, um, that we're going to be able to start at the edge of the Mediterranean, and we're we're going to we have all already done an analysis. If you read that Holy Grail of restoration, you find that uh, basically the pedosphere has slipped off the lithosphere, and it's all in the it's all, it's all in the sea. So if we remove some of the sediments out of the ocean. And we take them onto the land, then we'll have a we'll be able to start to restore some of the things that s slipped off, 
if we use these other mechanisms to have passive solar. And we also make thousands of interventions because we know the pathways that the water flows based on topographical mapping and, and satellite imagery. So if we make thousands of small uh, interventions that spread and sink this and, and just just block the flow slightly. Don't try to stop it because it's going to be a torrent. But just spread it and infiltrate it. Then we're already on the process and that's going to happen periodically but we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And But we also think if in the in the farthest part that we might we, we want to know why the North Africa and the Middle East desertified in the first place. So it seems like at, the, at if you look at pollen samples and you look at, at wind flows in the past, historically, that moisture was coming in from the Indian Ocean. And then seven, eight thousand years ago, the winds reversed and went back and it more or less created a vacuum pulling and, and that makes a lot of sense when you realize if you devegetate you create thermic drafts which cause moisture going to the upper atmosphere if you create this vacuum and it runs runs for seven or eight thousand years play a, a computer model of that for eight thousand years and you get the Sahara so okay so what if you were to be able to revegetate that and lower the surface temperatures, what would happen? Is it theoretically possible that you could reverse the air flows to come back in to North Africa and the Middle East? So that's been discussed at very high levels in scientific fora now, and nobody's said, well, that's just patently ridiculous. You know, you can't possibly do that. No, you know, so, okay, well, if there's a, even a smidgen of a chance, let's try this, you know, because this is the cradle of Western civilization. And we saw what you could do in the cradle of Chinese civilization, so what are you doing over here? And, uh, and if, you, if you do it, and, and then can you have fairness? Can you have equality? Can you have democracy? Can you have peace? That's really the questions finally and and now we're into psychology and social psychology so we have all these people who are really having serious stress and anxiety so how are they going to live their lives you know in this intense state of post traumatic stress it's it's not possible so i think the concepts of the ecosystem restoration camps are also about healing the human spirit so we can go let's make have pizza night you know let's have music let's let's do all these things because we need to if we don't do that we're probably not going to have the strength to carry on and we're seeing that I, I got two calls in the last two days one from Scotland and one no it was from Turkey but was reporting, reading a Times article from the Times of London that Scottish farmers were committing suicide. And I got a call yesterday from, from Australia and they were actually talking about Australian farmers committing suicide because they, they, can't, they can't deal with the stress levels. And I think this is terrible. And, and, and that's happening in India. For a long time, nobody was bothering with this, you know. And I remember back in the '60s and the '70s in Indiana, where I grew up, the small family farms were just going out of business left and right. It was horrible. So something is fundamentally wrong <laughs> here. And can it? Does it have to be the way it is, or can it be changed? You know, that that's really. I, I think we can we can do that, and I I think it uh, there are ways that this water business we're we're going to ha that's a fundamental aspect of ecology. So we're going to have to work with hydrology, but that's you can't just work with hydrology and walk away mm -hmm. because you can make some physical interventions, but they really quickly have to become biophysical because 
what's interesting about this is we are in these climate discussions and people are saying, well, okay, we could make machines to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. What are you talking about? You're, you're going to make, how many machines do you think you would need? You know, like where, where does the energy and the, the, the materials to make the machines, you know, this is crazy. And anyway, they last for a little while and then they turn into a piece of junk. So then you have a giant piece of junk there. Um, maybe we should think about something which is self-replicating, self-organizing, that already created the atmosphere and constantly filtered it and continuously renewed it. Of course, that's the way forward. It's the only way we can reach the scale. The scale of the solution will have to be equal to the scale of the problem. Hobart, uh -huh. come on, Hobart. From my perspective, I think it's really an economic question because we have valued materialism and we have said that growth and jobs are, are just necessary, that like we're, we're supposed to be workers apparently and, and others are supposed to be owners or something. I, th I think that um, we need to reevaluate what is money. So if money is coming from production and consumption of goods and services, or somehow it's being spun from speculation between the cost and the price of things, or it's coming from interest, from interest bearing debt, well, speculation between the cost and price and interest bearing debt, actually nothing happens. So there is a complete, uh, complete theoretical construct, it's nothing. And products and services, I mean, it depends. Like if somebody was saying, like, if you wanna, ha if you wanna uh, increase the economy, just throw a rock through the window because then somebody will have to, you know, 
<laughs> you'll have to manufacture glass and you'll have to fix the thing. But, you know, maybe we need to re reconsider and think what is value. So the value of ecological function is, high, is higher than any of these, certainly higher than these corrupt concepts like speculation between the cost and price and interest bearing debt. That's like indentured servitude. We're having a new type of slavery, economic slavery. Well, we don't like slavery, so we don't like economic slavery, so let's not have it. You know, let's, let's just not have that. And let's look at what is the actual value of ecosystem function. So ecosystem function determines whether we live or die, determines whether future generations have a life, whether civilization collapses or not. So we're not valuing that. It's ecosystem function is zero in the GDP kind of economy. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. So, all right, it doesn't, we, we have an irrational situation. Okay, we didn't know about that when we created our, our system, or let's hope not. Because if we did know about that when we created the system, then it was definitely evil from the very beginning. You know, so, okay, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It was not evil. It was just like this kind of developed over historical time. And, you know, there were people who were, you know, I mean, the idea that men are superior to women, you know, dom male domination, the idea of warfare, the, the idea like if you go into another country and you conquer them and you kill them, you know, like I stole it and it's mine. Now, what kind of a, what kind of a, of a justification is that? Like, it's kind of funny if it wasn't so tragic. It would be funny, but it's tragic. So let's have this conversation in public. And if everybody comes to the conclusion that, well, ecological function is more valuable than, than materialism and that, that human rights are inalienable and you don't have to pay for them, then, well, the world is, you know, then we're, we're, we're looking at uh, abundance instead of scarcity. And we're looking at caring for everybody instead of like being selfish. So let's let's not be selfish and let's let's go for yeah. You know.